All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Bill Ham, who is the chief operating officer and the driving force behind Broadwell Property Group. Bill, how you doing? Doing well. Awesome, man. Well, we like to jump right in. So if you could start with telling us a little bit more about yourself and what you like to do for fun, that'd be great. Absolutely. Yeah, I uh, I am a multifamily owner operator. So I, I buy, own and operate apartment complexes. Um, I have been doing that full time for almost 20 years now, just like 19 and a half years. Um, started off uh, in 2005. I was a pilot by trade. Saw uh, friends of mine doing real estate, and I thought, well, they're a bunch of idiots like me, and if they can do it, I can do it. So I went out and uh, bought my very first deal, which is a duplex. Um, it's cash flow at a few hundred bucks a month, and I walked away from a full-time aviation career to go into real estate uh, with, with a duplex. So better for worse, here I am. Uh, what do I like to do for fun? Uh, gardening. That's probably one of my biggest things is like growing stuff, uh, plants. I'm a plant dad. I like gardening, uh, aquariums, things of that nature, and um, usually reading. I read a lot. So those are probably my two biggest immediate uh, things I like to do for fun. Okay. Water sports probably be the third one. Yeah. Excuse I got you. Anything. What uh what books do you typically read? Oh, all kind of stuff. It depends. It de you know, it's hard to say. It depends. Am I reading something for like school business, real estate, you know, things of that nature? Then I like reading more on the news category or classics, things of that nature. Uh I mean, you know, I always just keep most funny people ask, and I, I literally didn't know you were gonna ask that, but I keep I guess you can see it. The prince. So one, I always recommend everybody go back and read the classic, the prince. That's a good one for business. And uh there's some other ones here. I got uh no, let's see. Uh, Sun Tzu, Art of Warrior. I was gonna have that one laying around, right? So you know, <laughs> things of that nature. I'm, I'm a classics. I, I like to read the classics. Um, uh, Wall Street Journal. You know, no, no plug for the Wall Street Journal, but I, I read the Wall Street Journal every morning. Uh, you know, two cups of coffee in the Wall Street Journal every morning. So everyone listening, if you want to talk about reading, read stuff that makes you better at conversation. You know, read things that give you things to talk to other people about. And that's why, I mean, I love reading the news, but, you know, that's what I have found from reading things like the Wall Street Journal and stuff like that, regardless of what you think about the news, you know, everybody has their opinion about media, but uh, it, it gives you something to talk to a stranger about besides the weather. Yeah. You know, if you, if you say up on current events, again, whether you enjoy it or not, it'll always give you something that you can speak intelligently to another individual that you just met besides something dumb like the weather and, and being in business, I have found that's really good for networking. So that's my opinion on reading. I gotcha. There we go. And so multifamily owner operator, you started with a duplex and right after you got your duplex, you left your job. Is that right? Yeah, I uh, was flying full time. Um, you know, was making an okay living. It's not like I was leaving some, you know, super golden handcuffs or anything. But uh, yes, yeah, so I was 28 years old, a corporate pilot. And uh, I had closed my very first deal, uh, which was duplex. And uh, I decided to go into real estate full time for, for better or for worse. <laughs> I'm still here. So did you just have some money saved up? Did you just decide to Ten take grand. a leap because you could turn some deals over quick enough? Ten grand. That's all I had saved up. Yep. The duplex was producing about $300 a month. That is if nothing broke. And uh, I'd saved up $10,000. And that's what I went into full time with. Yeah, I was able to do some short term sort of fix and flip type things and, and you know, do those sort of transactions that produce a little bit of money. Uh, and then while sort of building the resume or the, uh, excuse me, the uh, portfolio over time. And then, you know, as you get a portfolio of real estate, that kind of starts to produce revenue. But in the beginning, you, you've got to get a, an, an, a massive amount of real estate. They'll start to produce those returns. So you probably have to do some sort of fix, flip, short, you know, something. That's yeah. what I did. Get going. Okay. Okay. And so still acquiring multifamily in today's market. Or are you on pause? Tell me about that. Great question. Uh, I am still in the business. I am still very active. Uh, I am looking at deals. I teach on a regular basis. I'm very, very involved in the business. That business is a, a touch difficult today. Um, so it's not to say that I'm out or I'm off playing golf or I'm on the sidelines. It's not like that. I know what a good deal is. I will buy a good deal when I see a good deal at the moment with Pricing rates and some other things kind of going on in the world, good deals are just harder to come by. It's not that they don't exist. They're just fewer. So, yeah, things have slowed down, definitely. But um, it, it's something I, I talk a lot about. It's, it's market cycles. 
And in the markets, the economy, the world all kind of goes through these different cycles. And if you just learn to pay attention to them, you kind of more or less know what is coming. And, and the market always changes. So wherever you are today, it'll be different tomorrow. So I'm, I'm kind of just uh, hanging tight and not trying to do anything too stupid and uh, wait for a, a better day. Yeah, yeah, I got gotcha. you. And I guess my other question is, do you have any experience with creative finance or do you know who Pace Morby is? Do you know who Pace Morby is? Um, I, it's funny you ask that because I actually wrote that book back when Pace Morby was probably still in school. Yeah. Uh, so number one, my first 402 units I did with, with nothing but creative financing. I have the two books you see behind me that are both bestsellers on Amazon. And the book here is Creative Cash. Uh, it is nothing but how to do creative financing. I've actually been teaching that subject for about 15 years now. Really? That's so cool. Long I, before Pace Morby was probably, probably his age, probably still in high school. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's like early 40s, so. Oh, is he that old? Okay, I thought he was, yeah. just look, I don't know the man. So just looking at him, I thought he was a lot younger than that. Okay, then, then he's my, I'm 47, so he's a little bit younger than me. But uh, yeah, I have I started off again 19 years ago, My the duplex was seller financing. The yeah. very first deal was seller financing from a friend. And then I refinanced into a longer term loan. And I have done that many, many, many times. Um, lots of different ways of either using cash, lines of credit, borrowing money from people, partnerships, seller financing, lease options, all of it. Getting into real estate somehow because I didn't have money. I didn't have experience. I didn't have any way of just going out and writing a check for real estate. So I had to learn to create value. Um, and that was typically through solving someone's problem. You know, a lot like what Pace Morby teaches is like, go out, find some way that you can create value for an owner, exchange that value for, you know, the, the said property. Right. Um, and, and so, yes, we're all doing the exact same thing, but yeah, that's, uh, that's my book there. The only thing I would, I kind of warn everybody about creative financing, especially some of it is, um, you you there's some risk in there you're not exactly the owner like i think uh some of these teachers kind of make you think you you got to be a little careful uh you know i've had some of his students um that i've spoke to that sort of seem to think that in like a lease option deal that title has transferred in some manner and that they sort of technically own the property and it's not exactly true so just be a little careful with some of that do get information do study don't just go out and try and do a lease option or seller financing without some some information you you can make some mistakes yeah yeah, I got gotcha. you. And um, I guess that's why it's good to hear from multiple people in the creative finance Look, space, get in the industry, actually do some stuff, get some experience, because it may be a little different than it's advertised in 30 to 60 second reels. It's a great way to put it. I, I like that right there. It might be a little different than that 30 second reel you saw. In <laughs> yeah, agreed. And it is what it is great. It's a great model. And, and you know, I, I love that information. But yeah, do read the entire instruction manual before using. So you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got you. Well, tell us a little bit about your motivation. Yeah. What really gets you up and keeps you going every day? Oh, uh, hyperactivity, uh, hyperactive personality. I think uh, ADD yeah. probably. Uh, no, I, uh, I I enjoy business. Um, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Real estate is a product. Um, I am not passionate about real estate. I, everybody's kind of finds that. Um, I'm passionate about teaching. I do actually enjoy teaching and I, I do teach real estate as well. Um, I'm passionate about that. I am confident with real estate and I'm good at real estate. Therefore, that's what I do. But I always kind of try and teach people, young people and people that are new to business. Look, you don't have to be passionate about everything you do. That's that's a silly concept. And as a matter of fact, if you're super passionate about everything, it's easy to get unpassionate. And then, you know, especially when the, the times get tough or the, the business is tough or maybe the money's not that great that afternoon, you know, passion can kind of leave you high and dry. So I always tell everybody, just kind of figure out what you're good and competent at and be good at it and do it. And, and if you're passionate at it at the same time, that's great. You're lucky. But, you know, you can be passionate about plenty of stuff in life. Go get a hobby. You know, why is everybody going to be passionate about their job? It's a nice to have, but it's not a got to have. And the got to have is competency, right? You got to be good at what you're doing. And that's where I'm at with real estate. I'm very good at it. Do I love real estate? No, not really. It's just jobs, it's business. You know, I enjoy it, but it's not a passion. Yeah. It is a competency. I got you. Okay. Okay. And I'm curious, before we kind of jump to dreams and goals, tell me a little bit about what you feel is best marketing in real estate right now? Because I see people going direct to agents and trying to get 
pocket listings. I see direct mail, cold calling, cold texting. Like there are so many th- door knocking. There's so many things. Oh yeah. And, and they all work. Let me yep. be real clear. I have done every single thing you just suggested or mentioned and they all work. The question that I always kind of pose to people is how well does it work and how much energy should you put into that system such yep. as cold calling or sending you know, we buy stuff, postcards and things like that. It works real well on a house. Works a little less on two units. Works a little less on 10 units. Doesn't really work at all on 200 units. Yeah. Right. So it's like, well, what are you trying to buy? And, and so I would kind of tell you that I split the world into about 50 units and below and 50 units and above. If you're 50 units and below, you're going to get a a much, much, much stronger response with direct mail, direct contact, text, cold call, whatever. Those work much, much better on sort of 50 units and under. 50 units and above, you really start to get into the commercial realtor space. So I would kind of say, you know, number one, you want to learn the skill set of working with commercial realtors, no matter whether you're buying duplexes or 200 units. You know, you need to learn the skill of working with commercial realtors. And then anything under 50 units, yeah, if you want to try and reach out to owners, all of those things work about the same way. There's no one magic. Oh, if you send this postcard with this message, the phone ring, nah, it, it all works about the same. Um, realtors, I'll go ahead and tell you now that's the that's the end all answer. And people don't like that because that is a fair amount of work and you have to learn and build those relationships. Everybody likes the thought of a quick, easy plug play. Let me send some letters and the phone rings. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're not getting great responses, you, you need to figure out other systems. And the, the key is working with realtors getting deals off market through realtors. Mm. That's a strange sounding comment, I imagine, but it's true. What you've got to do is to get to know the realtors, build the relationships with the realtors so that when that future property shows up, right? The the realtor just signs up the listing. It's not out there on the world yet. They've not sent out a million emails to everybody. They just signed it up. They are very likely to call their short list of buyers that they've been working closely with and say, hey, everybody, you know, Timmy Bill, this is this, this is it. This is what you've been after, man. Stop by on Tuesday. We'll take a look real quick. You can go ahead and make an offer. That's where real deals are found, right? Because a good deal doesn't stay on the market long. A great deal doesn't come to the market at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're traded privately. Last three deals I sold, only one was on the market. The other two, I just called up realtors and said, hey, I'm thinking about selling. They called a few of their close buyers. That property sold. It was never on the market. It was never listed. It was never public. And if you didn't get one of those few phone calls from those few realtors, you never even knew the property was for sale. That's why I say it's really ultimately at the end of the day, if you're trying to break into commercial real estate. Now, I'm not talking so much about houses and flipping houses, but if you're trying to get into apartments and commercial real estate, you're going to need to learn the art of, of working with realtors eventually. Mm. And so what, what, what entails that art? Is it a lot of just networking and having those things to talk about like the news? Is there something more to it? Well, yeah, no. So, okay, great question. What I would start with is an understanding of, of the metrics of real estate, basically the numbers, the analysis, that would be step one. Step two would be understanding your market. All right. So what I'm really kind of saying is know the area, know the city, know know your market and, and sort of what's generally going on. I don't mean news a lot wise. I mean, like prices and rents and cap rates. Just know your market. And then you want to be able to underwrite or analyze that deal very carefully. And I don't mean just through creative financing. I mean, through a traditional manner of analyzing that deal, the income approach. All right. Once you've got that, you can analyze the deal and you know your market. Now you're ready to go out and start meeting realtors because you don't want to go out and meet a realtor and have them discount you um, credibility wise. You know, you go meet the realtor and the realtor says, well, well, gee, you know, Tim, what do you what are you trying to buy? What are you looking for? And you say, oh, I'm looking for a great deal with lots of cash flow and a wonderful price. You know, I mean, come on. That's a stupid answer. Everybody's yeah. looking for that. Right. You, you yeah. can't just go in there and go, I want a, a great deal. You know, like that realtor's been sitting around going, gosh, I, I had all these great deals. I just didn't know what to do with. I'm so glad you walked <laughs> in the door and said you wanted one. Oh, boy. You know, I mean, no. you really stop thinking about it. That's just stupid. So it's like you, you've you got to get to know these people and, and they don't they do not do business with everybody. You know, the commercial space is small. Another tip, a lot of these realtors expect, and it is expected in the space, that when you sell, you relist with the realtor that sold it to you in the first place. It's not a law. It's just sort of an understood in the business. So if a realtor doesn't know you to begin with, they're very likely to be cautious about really giving you uh, a lot of uh, information or secret deals. 
because they may be afraid that if they sell that to you, you're going to take that deal outside of their circle of influence. So that's a tip a lot of people don't understand about commercial real estate. And that's why I'm telling you, you got to get to know these people before they really kind of know, like, and trust you, right? Just because it's not the same as houses. You know, you think you just make an offer, they're going to get commission, go away. It's just not like that in the commercial space. A lot more detailed. Yeah, I got you. All right, man, let's go ahead and jump into dreams Good. and goals. Tell us about your vision for your life and your business. Life and business. Ah, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I hate that question. Mainly, no idea. <laughs> I get out of bed every day and just do what needs to be done. I, I don't have any great wowie zowie answer for that. Um, business, uh, you know, I, my, my life and business goals are probably pretty similar and I've, I've more or less obtained them. Um, I am not somebody that is, is trying to own everything in the world and, and see how rich I can get. I'm somebody who, who knows what I need to get by in a given day, a given month, uh, a given year, as far as revenue and income is concerned. And I like to work just a little bit more than what I need. And then I kind of spend the rest of my, my wealth in freedom and free time. So I work enough to maintain freedom, but I don't work and I don't create so much money that I get into another level of responsibility and lack of freedom dealing with the business and the things that I bought. Right. So I keep my business. My business goal is to always grow and be bigger, but at the same time where I don't sacrifice personal freedom in this pursuit of just random wealth. So I want to be, uh, you know, wealthy enough that I, I'm uh, comfortable, but not so wealthy that it becomes a burden in and of itself. Right. And so that's my, my general thought for my business and, and, you know, what I do in life. Yeah, I got you. And when did you come to that perspective? Was it always like that? Or did you get a little too wealthy with well, too a, much responsibility? And then you're like, let me good question. Around. Actually, I've never been asked that before. Um, I, I don't know that I have a terribly positive answer to that question. All right. My answer is after a fair amount of failure. Um, you know, I've had a lot of success and I've had a lot of failure. And and so at a point in time of doing this for a, a long time. I realized that, that money uh, has a diminishing marginal utility, right? Is Remember that from high school, right? Economics. If you, if you got a dollar, it's valuable. You got two, it's not as valuable. You got a million of them, man, it's not that valuable, right? So, so the more money you have, each dollar becomes less valuable, right? Easy. Well, what I've come to realize, though, is that each one of those dollars you want to go out and earn or create always comes with one pain in the butt factor, and that never diminishes, right? <laughs> so you're you're earning money and it's always a pain in the butt to do it, but it becomes worth less and less and less the more of them you get. And so after going through a fair amount of failure and having some hard times, I stopped to ask myself, really, is this worth it? Is this what I want out of life? Do I want to continue to work this hard, have this stress to have things that I don't really need or want? And that's where I kind of had to break it down. And it's been some years back now, but um, really kind of sitting down saying, you know, how much brain damage do I want to take on in this pursuit of wealth kind of scenario that I think people just go to sip in that Kool-Aid and they just think the American dream, we're all supposed to be as rich as we can possibly get, you know? And it's like, well, good for you. If you want to do that, that's fine. But keep in mind, that's a lot of work. Yeah. And it's going to eat up a lot of your free time trying to be that rich. I struck a balance between how much free time I want and how much money I want and figured it out. And now I'm just staying in that lane and that's good for me. But, um, you know, maybe that, maybe that's not the, the, the goal for everybody. You know, can't say it's right for everyone. Yeah, for sure. No, there we go. Um, I like you have two kind of contrarian perspectives here of like, A, you know, get enough just to be comfortable and get that income just to be comfortable and work a little bit more and then spend the rest of your wealth and time in freedom and free time. And the other one was that you don't really need to be passionate about the stuff you're doing. Like you would think that you would get wealthy so that eventually you could spend your time doing the stuff that you're super passionate about in your work. But it's like, no, just keep your work and then optimize for free time and spend all your free time doing the stuff that you want to do. And I like that perspective as well. Cause you don't hear it. All. It seems too many people work super hard through their life, not do anything that they're ever passionate about. And then they only have their retirement years in which to go and enjoy whatever they're passionate about. I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong, but I think I want to enjoy a little more of my life before I'm, um, halfway you know out of this place right i want to i want to kind of enjoy a little bit of fun while i'm still a little bit younger not not in just retirement you know and so that's where i but at the same time the cost of that freedom earlier on in life may be that you give up some of that giant wealth that you think you're supposed to have again if you've never thought of it it's just a different point of view 
you may think, gosh, this guy's crazy. I don't know why I'm even listening to him. Who knows? Yeah. But uh, it's right for me. That's all I can tell you. And I think it's a point of view a lot of people need to, to consider. You probably don't need as much as you really think you do. There we go. Well, Bill, tell us a little bit about um, what your day-to-day looks like. Now, if you've optimized for free time, is it like a 20-hour work week, 30-hour, 10-hour? 30. Work- 20, 30, somewhere around that range. Um, right now, and, and you know, that comes and goes, right? So, so next year, two months from now, the market changes. I might be doing 100 hours a week trying to buy real estate. Don't know. At the moment, normally speaking, yeah, I'm at about 30 or so hours a week. Um, half my week is is spent uh, teaching. So uh, I am I, I do teach real estate. I have these two books you can see behind me. Um, I have students. So I spend some of my week kind of talking to my clients and students. And then the other part of the week is out either looking at deals or meeting realtors or just generally, you know, analyzing deals. A lot of people think that a real estate business is this, you know, riding around doing all these uh, sexy transactions. All this. No, it's you sitting and staring at an Excel spreadsheet in a dark office all day. That's where the money is made in real estate, truly. You know, it's on a spreadsheet. It's not not where people think it typically is in this big transaction. Now, money's money's made in the boring way on that spreadsheet. And that's a real real estate business. And so that's what I do a lot of my time. It's just research and crunching numbers on deals, things like that. Do you ever see your portfolio get into a place where you don't have to work at all? Or maybe you're already there, but do you ever see yourself getting to a place where you choose not to work at all and your work weeks are looking like zero hour work weeks? That would be boring. No, I don't, I don't know. No, I don't, I don't, I don't think that would be healthy for me. Yeah. I don't think that would be terribly healthy for anyone. But that's again, my short opinion, you know, it's like, if you're not going to work, that's fine, but you better involve your time in something that's, that's close to it as far as your own personal mentality and health is concerned, you know? So do I ever, if you're asking the question of, do I ever see myself retiring sitting on the couch and watching tv for the rest of my life absolutely not no no yeah. so if it's not work in the sense of i'm being paid the dollar per hour kind of work it will be something work in that related volunteer work or something else so no i don't ever see myself being retired in the sense of i don't do real estate or something but and again what what am i retiring from i mean <laughs> you know what i mean that yeah. retire- 30 hour work week that's a bit offensive isn't it you know yeah no, no i don't ever see myself retiring no. i got you yeah it's it's funny because a lot of people talk about uh they'll come on the podcast dreams and goals is like early retirement financial freedom time freedom and just a bunch of travel you know all that and i feel like that's good for like a week or two like what they really need is just a really good long engaging vacation where they're not thinking about work and they've stepped away. And then when they come back, it's like, you don't really want to spend your time not working, not doing anything. I would agree. A lot of the people that have this point of view have never actually obtained any of that. And it's, it's what they read in the memo on somebody's t-shirt. And it's this sort of mean concept of what wealth and freedom means. And we've kind of got this, you know, uh, lifestyles, the rich and famous sort of concept of what wealth is supposed to mean. And I I think that's a a YouTube, Instagram kind of fed point of view. And it's not exactly reality because you're right. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to sit at the beach forever. It sounds like fun, but I assure you it isn't after a while. Even if you had so much money, you, you could literally just lay around in a coma forever and never work again. You know, congratulations. But I assure you, you probably will not find a much fulfillment in life in that kind of scenario. And I've also found people that wind up making that kind of money outside of winning the lottery. You could win the lottery. But anybody that that earned that much money in life is not typically the personality that wanted to sit at the beach forever anyway. Yep. You know what I mean? They're just not. They're just, they're going to get bored. They're just, you know. Uh So again, find something that keeps you fulfilled. Find something that, that, you know, you can be passionate about. doesn't necessarily have to be work. Uh, and, and enjoy yourself, you know, but um, yeah, everybody always kind of puts it like, oh, I got to have all this work here and then all this wealth over here at the end. Why not have it all now? <laughs> My opinion, you know. It's a great question, Bill. It's a great question. Yeah. It's like this retirement thing. How boring. Uh. Well, the rest of these questions might be a bit irrelevant to you, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Sure, let's see. What are the top one to two skills you feel you need to develop right now to make your dream life come true. So since you're kind of already living the dream, just one to two skills you want to develop. Yeah. 
good one. One or two networking, more more networking skills. That's something that we all always need to focus on is probably networking. And I tell you, that was one of my big mistakes earlier. Probably better question, better answer. Yeah, that that's something that I made a big mistake on earlier in my career was not networking and not putting the value in the quality of relationships with people around myself. And then when I was in trouble and or needed, you know, investments and things of that nature, I had not spent the time and energy um, really establishing the right quality of relationships. So I am not a very social person. I don't I, I just as well not talk to strangers in public. And so I think that's something I've had to develop in myself over time was learning how to not just indulge in my own personality and actually, you know, go out and meet people. So one, I would say, yeah, more and more networking. Um What's another skill that I would want to, uh, can't better, uh, better gardening, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah that, that was, I don't have great answers on that one. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> what What is it about gardening that really, uh, Oh, I don't know. It's very relaxing. I just, I've always been, uh, just some people I think are, are inclined to grow in plants and gardens and things like that. My grandmother sparked that up in me when I was a young kid. So I just always grow things. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> that's so yeah, give you better answer sorry <laughs> i mean but what does the work of gardening look like because i haven't touched it at all and so is it oh like, it's great like, you get to be, get to be a kid you get to go play in the, in the hose and the sprinkler and the dirt and get muddy <laughs> and get dirt under your fingernails it's great you're like get again <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so great so great <laughs> anybody listening who's gardener will know exactly what i'm talking about i'm talking to you all you know what i mean out there <laughs> yeah yeah, I could see something peaceful about, you know, be a leisurely activity where you're engaged and it's slightly productive, but it's not stress inducing and you're kind of outside, hands in the soil. I, I, I could see it. Don't think it's my personal yeah. but Yeah, well, right. It may not be. Well, see, you know, I'm I'm kind of a nature guy. I go hiking a lot, spend a lot of time just walking in the woods, things like that. Some other people may go, oh, there's bugs in the woods, you know. So, I mean, it's all a, a point of view, right? It just depends on on. But if you like getting dirty, try growing stuff. Try gardening. Yep, yep. Yeah, I really don't think these... Uh, so these questions are all about accomplishing your dreams and goals, but you have the one dream and goal, which is what you're doing right now. So... It's coming in, you know, we can. I can see if I can maybe give you an answer that would be a benefit to someone listening. If if not, then, uh, you know, we, I'll just say, hey, I don't... That's from that. All right, let's run through them. What are the highest, these for, right? <laughs> yeah, what are the highest impact daily actions that are going to tick the needle forward towards your dreams and goals? Now that I, that actually, I can answer that one. Yeah. So, so what I would tell you, what I tell everybody, and what I try and do myself is set up what would look like a successful week to you. This is this is an, a, a good conversation because I think a lot of Western mentality is very anchored towards goal setting. And I personally think it's a very big mistake. I don't think goals are a great idea. And I don't think long-term three-year, five-year and all this kind of stuff is a great idea. I think it's a lot, huge waste of your time and mentality. So what I tell everybody is to set up goals that um, you you can you accomplish by Friday and then reset on Monday, right? Yeah. And these are what I call discipline goals. So step one, what is a successful week to you? And this doesn't necessarily have to do anything with business or real estate, but sit down and be like, all right, if, if I got a Friday afternoon, five o'clock, and I look back over the week and I can say, yeah, I did these things. I feel good about that week. What are those things? And you want to kind of do that every single week. So just bringing it back more towards, you know, say real estate and business, like you would want to analyze three deals a week, right? I tell my students that you always got to look at three deals a week, whatever you're trying to buy, duplex, it's hundred units, two, whatever, three a week, right? So if you're at Thursday afternoon and you've looked at all three deals of the week, you're good. Let yourself go. If you get to Friday and you're like, hey, I've only looked at two, you have to hurry up and look at that last deal because come Monday, it starts all over and it doesn't carry from the last week and you don't get to like make it up on Monday. No, no, no. It's, it's succeed or fail every week. And so what I say is, is education. You want to, you want to do a little bit of education each week. Um, you know, maybe read a chapter two of a book, uh, networking, deal flow, um, you know, maybe exercise or personal health, different things like that. So figure out what are these things and then what is the frequency in one week that would be a successful week? Look at three deals a week, exercise twice, you know, two education pieces, go to one networking event, whatever. Set that schedule up and then repeat it every single week. If you'll do that, you'll find that these three-year and five-year goal things become kind of irrelevant, right? Because if you get up and go to work and do what you're supposed to do every day, your path kind of goes exactly where it's supposed to go. Yeah. But if you don't do what you're supposed to do every single day, every single week, then setting a three-year goal and a five-year goal is a complete waste of time because you're not going to get there anyway. 
Uh-huh. Right. And if you're doing the work, then the goal is irrelevant. So the goal is irrelevant, in my opinion, no matter how you look at it, really, you know, it's just like, don't worry about it. Just get up and do what you're supposed to do and it'll go the way it's supposed to go. And I think that's where people fall apart. They like the people that you may have been discussing on earlier shows. They have this destination of, of this place they're trying to get to, which is freedom and retirement and wealth. And it's this thing that they have out there somewhere in the future that they're always trying to get to. But it's never here and now. That's a mistake. You got to bring that stuff into the here and now, right now, and just eat your week and then forget everything else. It's yeah. Three year, five year goal. What a waste of time. My opinion. <laughs> I'll leave it that. <laughs> uh, a third contrarian perspective right there. The helpful of them, I'm sure. <laughs> I do I do like it though, because you set a three year, five year goal. And sometimes people will set a five year goal and it's either too too big. And then when you break it down to the weekly uh kind of cadence, they'd be like, Wow, I don't even want my week to look like that. It's like, well, you don't want that five year goal. <laughs> so <laughs> Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you want to be my five year goal is to own a million units in real estate. Cool. How many deals did you look at today? Oh, well, the kids. And then I had to pick up the school and then the wife. That, cool. How many did you look at this week? Well, the thing was you're wasting your time. There's no point in having that goal if you're going to make excuses and not go out and do the works. It's nonsense. Now, there's nothing wrong with three and five year goals. I'm being a bit harsh. But what I think people should do with those three and five year goals is stick them in a drawer and check back on them every year. Uh, but no, no more frequent than once a year. Yeah. You know, everything else is broke down to the week. Just do your weekly goals. And I agree that those three and five year goals are only good to like know generally where you're going and then know it generally where you're going, what the daily actions look like and the weekly actions look like to get there. Because something I used to overlook a lot was um, I used to set a goal and I would go really hard at it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I can keep this pace up. I can keep this pace up. And then three weeks later, to be like, ooh, I cannot keep this pace up. And so it's – what were you guys talking about? Now you're talking about the difference between shock zone and comfort zone. And that's a very, very important maybe, – maybe we don't get to these questions, but that's, a, that's an important concept you just brought up. A lot of people will go into a level of activity that is unsustainable. And that's what I call your shock zone, right? You you got to get out of your comfort zone, but you can't go so far that it's unattainable or unmaintainable. You know, New Year's resolution, I'm going to lose 20 pounds, exercise, quit, quit, quit drinking, quit doing all this. Thing. No, you're not. No, you're not. That's That's a crazy goal that you set one time. That's nuts. And that's why everybody fails on their New Year's resolution. Like, all right, that's shock zone garbage. You know, oh, I'm going to go take all these yoga classes and lose weight and exercise. No, you're not. You got to set yourself up a nice, gentle pace and reach that cadence of getting up to it. And that's what you're doing. You're picking a goal. You're going at it with too much momentum, too much energy flaming out and then realizing you can't maintain that. And then ultimately the goals drop and the whole thing. And now you can start having a negative loop feedback where you go, oh, gosh, I didn't obtain the goal. I must be stupid. Something must be wrong with me. And then now you're adding the negativity and then you didn't get the goal and then you add more negativity and it can really kind of loop back on yourself. So that's where, again, I think you got to be careful with those long-term goals, especially if you're not achieving them. And then you start internalizing negativity because you feel like you're some sort of failure or something. That's where, again, I, I think goals can be a, have a darkness to them that we don't understand in our culture. Go back to just doing your week, focus on your week and, and skip that long-term goal garbage and, and you'll be just fine. But uh, yeah, that's a big one, right? You, you're you going into your shock zone. Can't do that, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, when I start teaching students in real estate, one of the very first questions I talk to a new person is I say, well, listen, what are, you, what are your goals? Why are you here? What do you want to do in real estate? I'm looking for the person that comes on and goes, oh, I got to own a thousand units by next week, you know, something crazy. And then you can say, hold on, that's, you know, do you understand what it's going to take in your life to get there? How crazy of a life you're going to live to try and obtain that massive goal in the short term? You're not going to do it. Yeah. You'll fail, you know, and then and then you're going to fail on a large level because you'll probably quit. That's mm -hmm. a bigger problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. The shock zone. It's And it's a, such a common trap because, you know, people are like, think big, go big. And it's like, it's yes and no. It's like go big for you. Like don't go big as you for can. Me. Yes. <laughs> as you can. But you know what I have found is that people that typically espouse that point of view will will have some place for you to swipe a credit card real shortly after all that nonsense. You, yep. you get my point. There's gonna be some run to the back of the room, get out your credit card, swipe here, join up, sign up, rah, rah, rah. Careful, careful, careful. That's an easy pill to swallow when someone on stage is pumping your head full of you know, big dreams and go now, go big, go, 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 and go to the back room and give me money. You know, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
careful with that. That's watch out. Yeah. If you're really leading up to a sales pitch. Yeah. No, absolutely. And so that's something that's been a uh, going into that shock zone so many times, failing so many times, and then recognizing that negative feedback loop and reading these books and understanding how negative thinking affects you versus positive thinking. I was like, oh wow, it's so much more beneficial for me to do something small for five minutes every day and be able to be consistent with that, even if it's a minute, just to build back my confidence and trust in myself. And then, you know, you can scale the things you're doing consistently as opposed to going real hard for two weeks and then burning out again. It's a great way to put it. Actually, I'm going to write that down. Hey, trust in yourself. That's that's it right there. You just said it. It's trust in yourself. And I hadn't really thought about it in those words, but that is a great description. You're right, because if you start setting up too big of goals and you have failures, you may stop trusting in yourself and not even realize you've done it. And that's part of that negative loop back. You know, you're setting goals that are unobtainable. So you don't obtain them. And then you blame yourself. And you're like, well, that's that's certainly not helping, is it? You know, and then you can really kind of get into that um, depression cycle. I've been there. Entrepreneurial depression. We can do a whole show just on that. You know, yeah. it's a real thing. You have to be careful about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, what character trait do you feel you most need to develop right now to make your dream life come true? Or do you what character trait do you think holds people back the most if you can't speak to it yourself? Yeah, um, my, I'll answer it both ways. Yeah, my character trait, uh, probably more consistency. I can be flighty. I can be ADD. So probably to be a little more uh, consistent, even though that's all we're talking about is consistency, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that that's probably mine. Now, what I will say in, in answer to maybe something that someone else could get something out of, um, one of the biggest things you're going to have to get over is failure. You're going to have to get good at failing. You know, you're just going to have to. And and success stands on the shoulders of failure, right? So you're never going to be successful until you master failure. So the people that I, I find that are the toughest students to deal with are the people that have the least probability of success are the ones that show up with the I cannot fail attitude. That is the biggest failure you can possibly have is to think I can't or won't fail or I cannot afford to fail. I can't help you. You know, I have people walk up and go, oh, I need to work with you because I can't make any mistakes. I can't help you. You know, then you're already failed and you don't even realize how big of a failure you've already made. Right. So you got to it's kind of like these uh, this incremental thing of, of weekly goals and weekly. Yeah, we want to avoid the shock zone. Well, you want to try and avoid the shock zone failures, too. Right. You want to try and avoid the massive losses and blow ups. But you've got to understand that, you know, daily. Um, most things don't have a high probability of success, right? Um, I, I like about a 15 to 20% success rate on a new venture, right? Now, that sounds weird. So that means if I'm going into something brand new, I've never done it, never studied it, I plan to fail about 80, 85% of the time if it's something new. So if it's like a new plan, a new garden, a new whatever, I plan on screwing this thing up a bunch, yeah. learning. Right now, that way I, I can take the small failures and avoid that big, massive failure, which is what happens when you go too far, too fast shock zone. That's where you occur the big, giant failures because you weren't preparing yourself all along with the small ones. Right. Same as you. You know, it's like if you were doing the exercise weekly, then you could go run the marathon. But if you just wake up one morning and decide you're going to run out the front door and join a marathon, you're going to fall over dead. It's just not going to happen. Right. Yeah. So it's that it's same as failure, right? If you go too big, too quick, you will fail too big, too quick. You may not recover. So be careful about that chasing the the dream kind of thing, you know, increment. Yeah, no, for sure. It's funny that you mentioned marathon because I was uh, a friend was like, hey, let's run a marathon together in February. And so I committed to it. And jogging has been horrible for me. It's been like a I can usually overcome some mental hurdles or I can attack stuff. I couldn't attack jogging. And it was because of this mindset I had with shock zone. He told me, he was like, the the real reason most people fail at jogging is because they jog too hard, too fast. Like your heart rate shouldn't get above 140 when you're jogging most of the time. And for most people, that's like a 12 to 15 minute pace. Like you're just barely moving. And so I'm a, I'm an athletic guy. I can move you wanna... fast. Yeah. But with jogging, my like respiratory system and how my body is, it's not developed to the point where I can move fast for a long time. And so. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. That's why you have sprinters 
and, tr- and long distance runners and, and the two shall never meet, right? A sprinter is not a long distance runner. Long distance runners usually suck at sprinting, right? They're not the same uh, athletic com- competency nor competitive sport. Yep. You don't see sprinters competing against, uh, you know, marathon runners. It's not the same sport. Yeah. Same, yeah. same reason. That's why I, I was jogging today and I hit my like 10 to 12 minute pace. And I was like, this was, this was great. Like I like this form of jogging. Cause right. usually when I'm jogging, I'm dead in like like a minute to a minute and a half. And it's just because I'm moving too fast. When I kept the slow pace and like embraced that patience and didn't go into that shock zone, shock failure, um, I was able to maintain the jog for 20 minutes. And at the end of it, I was like, I definitely could have gone further. And so, yeah, it was just an exciting. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's that, that sprint. Everybody wants to get in and just start running fast as they can. Business the same way, you know, I, I, I wrote an article about this a little while back. I'll, I'll tell you one of the biggest things that I see people fail at, one of the biggest reasons for failure in, I think, in real estate, probably any business, certainly real estate, boredom. Yep. You get bored. You come out in a sprint. You realize it's not as exciting at that pace as you had thought. You know, you signed up for the program. You're studying with me. You come out. You're like, I'm ready to close. Let's do the deal. And it's cricket chirping. You know, and you you thought you're going to fling the doors of business open to the roar of the crowd. It's like, nope, nope, it's quiet. And people just get bored and they wander off and they just don't come back. You know, they were like you, they were expecting this to be a sprint. They tired themselves out and they just didn't have the stamina and they just wander off. It's not any kind of major bankruptcy and this having that. Nah, it's never that. It's just you drift off, stop looking at deals, get bored, find something else to do. It just wasn't as exciting as you had signed up for. Yeah. Or maybe perhaps as that guru told you, it'd be go big, go fast, go, uh, you know, that's, that's bad advice. Yeah, for sure. Well, Bill, if there were one or two people you could meet right now, and this could be a specific person or a type of person, and they'd really help you take that next step towards your dreams and goals, or for people generally, who would you tell people to meet? Who would you meet? And how would they help you? Good question. I hadn't thought of that one. You just sent me that like earlier, so I could have a good answer for you. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm just thinking me because like me, me people, I'm probably going to want to go back in time, right? I want to go back and meet some kind of historical individual. That's a tough one. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'd want to go back and meet some of the great minds like, uh, you know, Einstein. I don't know about Einstein. I go back further than that, like, you know, Aristotle or something. I don't know how that they would help me really, perhaps maybe just a you know, better understanding of the world or, or perhaps I could glean some information from those people that I could bring here and share with people in today's world. You know, something esoteric like that. Um, who should people meet? Um, okay, that's probably an easier question for me to answer. Yeah, you got to figure out what is it you're trying to accomplish and where you're trying to go in life. And then you really need to surround yourself with those type people. So if you are looking to get into real estate, you know, um, let's say, excuse me, just for this conversation, you're trying to break into investing, things like that. You want to you want to surround yourself by people that have a positive point of view about education and information. I found a lot of people in real estate, a lot of people in, in business are, are kind of anti read a book, anti pay for information, just figure it all out on your own kind of thing. That's a point of view. I think it's a, a short, narrow sided point of view, but uh, surround yourself by positive people that are already in the real estate business. So be going to your RIA groups, your your networking groups, um, things like that. Don't have to spend big money. So I'm not saying sign up for the big ticket items that everybody sells, but go to as many um, networking groups as you can. Just meet people and make friends. You know, that's all it is about. And, and it's, it's, it's just building the Rolodex. It's not about commitment for money or raising money or getting anything from anybody. It's not. It's just meeting new friends that might be there for you someday in the future. So that's my tip is just network like crazy. It's the biggest mistake I have made in my career is not knowing enough people. Yeah. Yep, not having enough relationships. That's the one thing I've learned a lot. Um, everything runs on people. Like, I know it's a silly thing to say, but like, if you gave yourself a trillion dollars, but you were isolated on an island, that trillion dollars would be worth it absolutely is. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right. You got it's, it. It's, yeah, it's just interesting to me because so often, like, especially how we're taught growing up, like we're all, always evaluated on what our individual performance was, but then so much of the real world is like collaboration. And yes, you need to be solid as an individual, 
but only insofar as you can collaborate and provide value to others. And so it's a, it's a real interesting perspective because you're not being graded on a math test anymore. It's like, okay, how good are your relationship skills? How good can you build those relationships? And then how well can you provide value in your specific activity? Provide value. That's the key right there. Yeah. Provide value for others. Yep. Have something to trade. Always have something to trade. Yeah. And so I just realized the importance of people and then also getting focused about who you're around. Like even with this podcast, something I've noticed is that like I bring on anybody to talk about their dreams and goals. Right. But I would serve people better if I really niched it down and focused a bit more to a specific um specific avatar who's bringing a specific message for a specific group of people. Now, is that what I want to do? Maybe, maybe not, but would it serve people more arguably? Yes. And so just something I've been thinking about, like, not only is it people that are important, but also the type of person you're surrounding yourself around and the intention that goes into choosing that person. There you go. Yeah. I like those words. Yeah. Very good. There we go. Well, now we're going to jump into our thriving three. So what is your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one of the three. Uh, favorite book, movie, or podcast? Oh, movie. That would be tough. I don't know. I don't want to be movies. Book. What would my favorite book in the world be? Uh, I, I, I'm going to go back with The Prince. As I mentioned that one earlier. I know that's kind of probably a pretty banal answer, but uh, we'll go with that one. <laughs> I've literally never heard of that book. What is it about? Take us into it a little Nocky bit. Valley, it's, it's, it, it depends on how, how you want me to answer that. The technical answer of The Prince is it, it's, uh, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli back in the uh, 1450s or whatever it was is writing a tree a, 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 a treatise to a young prince on how to be a governor of a country. So it's it's a a professional person writing to a young prince, hey man, here's the instruction booklet on how to be a good ruler of a, a kingdom. That's a real 10,000 foot view of it. Um, what I read it for and what I like it for is that if you kind of swap out prince with CEO, if you kind of take away nation or country and, and swap out with you know, corporation, you can read these books, um, this, The Art of War and, and The Prince and all these different books and kind of take a different bit of message from it. So it's all in how you read it. If you read it just because you're trying to read history, that's one type of reading of the book. If you're reading it to try and have a greater understanding of, of how humans work and in relationships with humans work, it's great. And then you can apply that to whatever you want. So um, I would say it's a book on relationships. If you really want to know my answer, that's, that's what it really is. It's a book on, on the rights and wrongs of working with other humans. Mm. There we go. And what's one way you like to take care of yourself? Um, uh, <laughs> try and exercise. <laughs> that's uh, trying to relax. Yeah. Try and not work too hard. Try and not work for things I don't really care about having. That is a good, good answer. Yeah, that, that's my answer right there. And what what is one action step you could take right now or continue to take if you're already doing it to meet that person who would help you get a better understanding of the world? So I know it's not going to be a historical figure, but maybe somebody um, out there today who would help you get a better understanding like that historical figure would. Someone that, that was, uh, I would say they would have to have achieved their comfort, right? So it's not really about, I wouldn't look at them and say, well, how much money do they have or how much wealth or how much any of that kind of stuff. I would really say, how happy are they? So so I would want to, you know, find that person that um, I, I, I kind of, sounds arrogant, but kind of like myself that have reached that level of comfort and happiness and say, all right, how did you do it? You know, how did you maintain it? More of that level. Right. Because because nobody's happy all the time. Let's be clear. Because people ask me, are you happy? Some days, some days not. I mean, let's, you know, it's not like everybody's always happy all the time. That's silly. Right. Yeah. So you just want to kind of maintain a general happiness. You yeah. Know, that stuff happens. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. For sure. And so we got our final section here. It's all about limiting beliefs, abundant beliefs, beliefs in general. What is a limiting belief that continues to pop up in your life, if any? Uh, limiting belief. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm bad at, at networking and raising money uh, to pay for real estate. That's probably a limiting belief. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm not sure it's really true. That's why it's a limiting belief. I feel like it's true. Yeah. You know, it's like one of those things you're probably good at it, but you really feel like you're not. And so you always have that negative point of view about what you're doing when you don't really suck, but you think you do. That's probably my limiting belief is that I'm, I'm not really good at, at meeting people, building those relationships. 
I got you. Where's that come from? Because 19 years in the business, a lot of I people lost assume, 50 grand like, once. Oh, okay. you think, right? And, and then I, I went to raise money. It's been a few years ago now, about five years ago. Went out to raise money for a deal. Um, I was syndicating the deals, real estate deal. Uh, I went out to raise money to get the deal done and failed. And uh, I personally lost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in earnest money that I had put up against the deal. So that one, now it's uh, you know, it takes a little while to to forget losing one hundred and fifty grand cash. But eh, you know, what are you gonna do? Yeah, I'm all right. Made it back, fine. And that's kind of my my point to everybody out here. No matter how big your failure is, if you're still alive, you can deal with it. You'll be all right. Yeah, you know I mean, don't worry about it. It's, you're not as important as you think you are. <laughs> That's the lesson I learned, right? I thought, I thought, oh man, after making that mistake, I'm the laughing stock of the world. Nobody's gonna do business with me. Everybody's like, nobody cared. I yeah. really wasn't that important. Yep. Do you have any? Do you have any limiting actions or inactions that reinforce this belief, this limiting belief in your life? You know, you kind of can talk yourself into not taking action, right? That's easy. That's that's it. It's like, and that's why I got back to those discipline goals, because you got to make yourself go out and do it. If if you, if if I just say, well, I'm supposed to go out and raise a bunch of money, but I don't really think I can do it. And I don't feel like doing it. I'm probably going to talk myself out of doing it. I'm a lazy person to begin with. So that's why I have to kind of create these structures around myself that takes away my natural personality and makes me do it anyway. Right. So that's probably what I would have to answer in there is that uh, just general laziness. Yeah, just yep. don't do it. Yep. I gotcha. Last question. What is your favorite belief about yourself? My favorite belief about myself. Boy, these are some first time questions I've never been asked before. Favorite belief about myself. <laughs> um, um I'm brave. That, that, that I, I know that I can I can handle most things that are that are thrown at me. I can defend myself in most scenarios and I can put up with a lot of failure. I've been I, I know how to take a punch because I've been punched, you know, that kind of thing. I know what failure feels like, so I know that I can I can push through it now. And that takes experience. So if you don't have experience and you don't feel that way, don't feel like you can't feel that way. It just I, it takes practice. You got to go out and screw up a whole bunch of stuff and then yeah. you'll be really confident at screwing up stuff. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> just don't stop. That's the key. Just don't quit. You'll 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 get it right eventually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Bill, that's all we got for you, man. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, this Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Is there anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? No, not at all. Um, hey, I got these two books on Amazon, uh, Real Estate Raw and Creative Cash. Certainly go check those out if you're looking to break into the real estate business. These are two really good books that will help you do that. So you can certainly check that out. And I, I give everybody my email address. If anybody has any questions or wants to, to ask me anything, uh, it's, it's easy. Bill at gobroadwell.com. Uh, B-I-L-L at gobroadwell, B-R-O-A-D-W-E-L-L.com. Give me an email. Sounds good. If you guys are listening to this, you loved what Bill had to say. You're looking to get into real estate. Make sure to buy those two books. Shoot him an email. All the links to do so will be down in the show notes. Thank you guys so much for watching. We will see you on the next one. And on that note, we're out.